Welcome to this episode of the Today Dreamer podcast and thank you for being here in this moment with me and our lovely guest today who is none other than Peter Russell. It's our second conversation. The first one was on letting go of the mind and this one's more based on slowing down, slowing down the mind. So Peter is an author and a speaker, and he's written a book recently called Letting Go of Nothing, Relax Your Mind and Discover the Wonder of Your True Nature. There'll be a link to Peter's book in the description, the show notes section, which I highly recommend you check out. And in today's conversation, we'll be exploring one of the things we do on every podcast, which is just pausing, pausing for a moment and being with what is. So, before we get into things, I'd like to invite you to deepen your connection to the show if you've been listening for a while now by clicking the subscribe button. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit the notification bell. And if you'd like to take things to the next level and you feel like you're getting something really valuable out of these conversations, please consider supporting the mindful media vibes that are radiating outwards from this space by joining the Today Dreamer tribe over at patreon.com forward slash Today Dreamer. This will give you the opportunity to pledge a small amount of support on a monthly basis in exchange for exclusive gifts and perks and surprises from my end. I'm not going to get too much into it, uh, but definitely check that out at patreon.com forward slash Today Dreamer. You can also support the show by telling a friend about it or sending me a message of feedback or just to connect and say hi I really appreciate that and I feel motivated and supported whenever I receive uh, loving messages in that way also uh, feel free to check out the audio only version if you haven't already and if you're listening to the audio only version feel free to engage with some educational YouTube videos that I put out regularly as well Okay, that's pretty much all there is to say. Let's jump into this episode. As I like to do before the start of every episode, I'd like to invite you to pause for a moment, just to pause from whatever's happening in your life and to take a mindful breath. Usually do this by as slow as possible and as naturally as possible, breathing in through the nose and into the belly, deep into the belly, pausing at the top and just sitting in that space before gracefully exhaling and pausing at the bottom as well. And when we drop into that space with one another, we'll gently take off into our conversation and see what insights and knowledge and wisdom we can uncover. So invite everyone to gently close their eyes. Just as slow as naturally feels possible, take in a really nice deep inhalation through the nose. Take your time with it and when you reach the top, Take a moment just to pause before exhaling just as gradually and gently on the way out. But yeah, so just kind of this idea of slowing down, being present and allowing allowing things to unfold um, based on, I want to say feeling, but I don't mean emotions. I kind of mean like an instinctual knowing um, 
which which direction to whether to zig or whether to zag in that particular um, moment in time and it seems to be a lot clearer when i do that but it seems like you know there's this back and forth between remembering to slow down and, and being caught up in the in the rush of life have you had a, have you had similar experiences or have you come to that oh yes yes yeah. yes yes um, um it's a challenge certainly a challenge for me at times like a whole culture is conditioning us to do and do more and do it faster and be more efficient and you know i think these days so many pressures on us to do things we get so caught up in it it's what in our busyness and we're we're so busy we just don't take time to pause and just notice how we are how we're feeling so i think the slowing down is is really really important and it's not just slowing down physically it's slowing our minds down our minds which are racing got to do this got to do that it's the minds which are sort of driving us forward and so in the slowing down it's like well we started with that pause but for me the pausing is also pausing our thoughts, not just pausing our bodies, but pausing, pausing the thinking, just whatever we're thinking, just saying, okay, not now, later maybe, but for now, I'm not going to follow you any longer. And as we do that, we just begin to slow down. And I think you're right. We begin to, the way I would phrase it, get in touch with our own innate wisdom, which is you know always there, which is more about, you know, what, what is the most appropriate thing to be doing right now? But all the time we're engrossed in our thinking and busyness, that innate wisdom doesn't get a chance to shine through. And so we're following one thought and then this and then that. And by slowing down, exactly as you say, we begin to get in touch with that, with that inner knowing of what's the most appropriate thing to do. And that's why I think it's, it really is valuable, apart from the fact we're actually um, not getting quite so stressed up when we're slowing down. We, we get so stressed by all the chasing things so it's also a good antidote to the stress to slow down yeah you've been asking like where am i rushing into anyways like you know <laughs> you know do you get what i'm saying like what's like if, if i'm in such a rush or even in the biggest perspective of things like you know sometimes we have these these things that we want that we see in the future that we kind of want to accomplish or move towards and i and i feel as though you know, these kinds of things are going to come up naturally as well. Um, but it seems as though, well, there's no real rush. And if we step back for a moment, it, you know, what's really going on here mm -hmm. and taking a breath and then moving, it's like, it's like rebuilding the muscle of being able to kind of move into our innate wisdom into that direction that that may be, you know, presenting to us rather than just kind of mindlessly going in loops right right and also so much of what goes through the mind is totally unnecessary i mean not to put down thinking i mean thinking is really valuable it has its time and place i used to feel like it's a superpower when i was young like oh i'm so analytical i i can i can see things from so many different perspectives and that's a really good thing and now i'm kind of seeing it as the opposite but I think it is good in, in its own time and place. But what often happens is we get caught up in our imagination. We start imagining what might happen, how to cope with that. And we start planning stuff in our mind, which probably never comes about. Or we start thinking about what happened, thinking, oh, if only that had been better. So a lot of the thinking is actually not even necessary in the first place. And so that's another value of slowing down and pausing the thinking is we're just stepping out of this totally unnecessary things we get caught up in when do you think it is necessary to when do you think the mind does kind of come into play and when do you think we can really put the, the pedal down and in, in that front um with a with a sense of okay this is flowing nicely rather than it being something that's taking away from right. the way i'm being well it was um i've been mean, taking an example for myself if i'm you know, working on, say, the, the design of a web page. You know, I run my own website. So I'm thinking about that. There's a certain amount of intuition that's involved in just like artistic feel, but there's also a lot of logical thinking. Okay, if I do that, this has to be done and that has to be done. And so the code has to look that way. And so on a particular task, the thinking is very, very necessary. 
And there's lots of tasks in our lives where, where the thinking is important, particularly when we're planning, planning what to do, whatever, even planning a meal, something like that, planning what to eat. You know, it's important. To think, okay, what do I need? What have I got? Do I need to go to the store for anything? So how do we so, notice when that when that line is crossed between kind of thinking and then just r ruminating into something like churning over and over? Right. I think it takes um, some self-awareness and self-reflection. I mean, some of some of the time um, when we're churning over and over, there's a sense of tension that gets created. And so if we if we're feeling the tension, that's a good time to say, hang on, let's stop. Is this thinking is this thinking really necessary at this moment? So noticing if there's any intention or particularly if there's an insistence to it. If it's like, oh, got it, you know, this is really important. Got to do this really important. Just pause and say, hang on. Is this really important? Do I really need to do this? Um, and I have, you know, a couple of questions I sometimes ask myself as a way of stepping back is, you know, if I'm thinking I've got to do something, got to get something or whatever it is, go somewhere, is to say, you know, if I, if I did get this, would I really be happy, content? And the answer is probably not. And then I ask the opposite question, if I don't do this or get this, can I still be happy? And the answer is always, well, of course, yes. Mm. So it's a way of stepping back and not being so caught up and absorbed in the question. Yes, yeah, that's interesting. So the, you're developing this sensitivity to the tension and then just kind of stepping back and just kind of contemplating a little bit about it. Do you yeah. have any other questions that if you uncover, this is something I was a bit curious about. This might sound a little bit random with the direction we're currently heading, but it kind mm -hmm. of let's let's bypass the thinking and let's just go straight into it i was thinking i was feeling sorry <laughs> into this question of what's your process for contemplation when you uncover a, a new insight that you haven't maybe come across before from that particular perspective do you have any questions you may ask yourself in that situation um yes i think um is, is this new insight, is it more caring? Is it more compassionate? Um, and that's usually a good sign it's coming from my own inner wisdom. Um, is it true? And just to step back and say, actually, is, is, this, is this insight, you know, I can get carried away by it. You know, just, just to check in, is it true or am I getting off on some fantasy of myself? So th those sorts of things I think are important. Yeah. And, and do you spend, I know it's kind of like, I'm just kind of curious about more about, because last time we spoke about, you know, your history and, and a couple of things that some beautiful experiences you've had in your past and where you got to be kind of into this position where we are now. Um, obviously, we, we only kind of scratched the surface, but I was wondering a little bit more about, I was just curious about the way in which you you know have your practice of presence now it seems like it, it must be quite fluid like it's obviously intertwined into everyday life but do you have like a structured practice that you play out um in the background of all of that uh yes in a way I, but i'm not sure if it's structured mm. um i think there's there's a couple of aspects to it i mean one I have a sitting practice which is just sitting down usually for me around 20 minutes or so just you know, classic sort of quiet, being quiet meditation, um, just settling back into my own inner stillness and just, and just, just being there, being with that for a while, which is you know, really, really refreshing and gets me out of my head. And then I have what we're doing with the pause thing at the beginning. I like to do that as many times day as possible i have notes i leave around the house telling me to pause i have to move them around because after a couple of days i know where they are they don't catch me anymore but then the pausing a bit like what we we're saying at the beginning first of all you know to stop what i'm doing and then to sit down or stand i'll try to do it just do it i just do it standing where i am and just pause the thinking for a moment just for a moment and just notice how do i feel and always when we pause, it's like, it's usually a sense of, ah, there's a sense of ease, there's a sense of relief, there's a sense of coming home, coming back to myself. 
And just to savor that for, you know, it could be anything, it could be 10 seconds, half a minute, doesn't really matter. It's not about staying there for a long time. It's just like pausing and just coming back and just remembering, ah, there is this quieter place inside which feels much more like home. And, ju and just to touch into that as often as possible. And I think the more I do that, the more motivation there is to do it more often. And also the more familiar it becomes. It's like, oh yes, I know you. Or it's rather, yes, I know me. Um, yeah, and, it, and it's lovely. It's, you know, it's a lovely thing to be doing in the day. Yeah, it's, so, it's beautiful to sprinkle that throughout the day and have have that just kind of constantly coming up as a, as a practice and it's almost like it blends into the way in which you live. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had, I had a thought recently and I was kind of preparing to go away on this little mini retreat a couple of months back and the thought was that you could, it, it seemed possible for the first time, like I always kind of thought, you know, you're floating in and out of this state, but I, it seems like that could be a space you could live in because I feel like I've witnessed people living in that space before. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's a lot of practice that goes in and this kind of sprinkling throughout the day, you know, must have built up to something. And I kind of thought, you know, maybe even aiming towards that, even if it wasn't something that I would get to, it would still be a beautiful thing to do because there'd be so much more presence. And then from that presence, you know, so many, so much beauty would be born because I'd yeah. just be there. Oh, yeah. 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 And I think that's one of, you know, the paths to, to, being there more more frequently and more solidly is sort of what is often called the progressive path. It just you just gradually it just gradually unfolds in your life little bit by little bit. And I think that's the way it is for most people. You know, some people who have you know an amazing awakening, they completely let go and that's it. They're there. But I think that's they're one in a thousand. If that for most of us, it is this progressive path, and that's why some regular sort of practice of just coming back, touching in is, is really important. It seems to me a big component of that, a uh, component of that, that kind of um, moving onto that path or that progression is kind of moving away from the seduction of different experiences and coming mm -hmm. back within. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, that again is, you know, when we pause, I think we can we can begin to see how we're being seduced by stuff. It gives us time to, time to reflect. And there's so much. I mean, our whole society is geared up to seduce us in one way or another into something, whether it's entertainment, work, whatever it is, something or other. We're being continually seduced. In a way, we're being seduced away from ourselves. And the spiritual work is actually pausing in one way or another to come back and reconnect with our real self as opposed to we just take i mean everything is just taking us out into the world in, into activity into form and, and even our thinking is taking us out into the world and that's why the essence i think of the spiritual practice is pausing and then turning the attention within and as we turn the attention within we begin to say we begin to notice this inner sense of i am this inner sense of being which is always there but most of the time not even noticed because with our attention is on the outside mm. yeah and it seems like if we try to do like it, it's hard to just probably wouldn't be the right way to go to just kind of cut off everything um intensely like we said maybe some people would, yeah, yeah yeah and then there's like this there's this other kind of progressive route which you've mentioned but it seems like there's a dipping back in and out and um, yeah. a, a gradual kind of shift that takes place over yeah. over over some time, um, over continuous practice and, and effort and maybe not even effort. Maybe it's lack of effort in a sense. It's definitely, I think, a, a lack. It's learning to let go of effort. I think that's an important part is learning to let go of effort. But it's making the effort to do that in a sense as well. <laughs> well, it's making the commitment. The commitment, yeah, maybe effort's not the right word. Yeah. 
yeah. it's moving, the, it's directing yourself in that direction. Having, yeah. having the intention to do it, yeah, but not, not putting effort into accomplishing the intention. Yeah, the effort actually seems to be what we were talking about earlier about like this striving, this kind of mm-hmm. almost like could be seen as forcing um, ourselves into something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Effort just tends to make the mind more tense, more active, more tight. And what we're talking about here is going in the opposite direction of allowing the mind to relax. Mm. You know, it's a bit like if you've got a tense muscle, you can't put effort into making it relax. It just, you know, you just get screwed up. But if you just notice the tension in the muscle and be with it, often it just begins to unwind of its own accord. Mm. And I think, I think it's the same with our minds. They, we just let it, we just be with it. They, they want our minds want to settle down actually if we stop fueling the thoughts then we can just begin to settle down naturally Mm. Mm. so i was hoping we could touch on some of your other interests and i know that you've done a lot of work in and you've you know science has caught caught your (laughs) attention in this lifetime and um you're interested in in space and you've you've done a lot of talks around evolution as well and Mm -hmm. i find your ideas to be fascinating especially um what you shared around the way we've come into being and the way the direction or what what seems to be the way that we're heading or what you what you're feeling into in that respect Mm -hmm. i wonder if you could share a little bit about that and you know, see if we could even tie that up with what we were just talking about in some way would be interesting. Well, I think it all ties up. Yeah. Um, yeah. When you say, um, you know, how I see how we've how we've come here, which which aspects were you thinking of pointing towards? Any that may come to mind initially for you, or or to your to your heart, whatever kind of arises within you. When I say that, okay. Well, I think taking the bigger picture, Mm. I think the fundamental goal of all beings is to survive. It's that simple. I mean, life wants to survive. If you think whatever an organism does, in one way or another, it's doing it, it's feeding, it's sheltering, it's procreating, it's running away from predators, whatever it is, it's doing it in order to survive. So an organism's sole purpose really is to survive and that's that's true of us as well basically most of what we do is you know looking after this body or taking care of our social environment we're doing things to keep the the body survive and if we're if everything is okay in our environment if there are no threats and our needs are satisfied we feel okay basically we feel okay inside and that's what i call our natural mind our natural state of mind is actually one of contentment that that's how we feel when everything is okay when things aren't okay when there is some danger some threat to our safety or survival then we feel discontent quite naturally and we do things in order to remedy the situation and come back to feeling content and that's why it's often said you know that the fundamental drive of all human beings is to be happy basically what we're looking for whether we call it happiness or inner peace or peace of mind or joy whatever we're looking for a better state of mind and that's completely natural that's that's our real bottom line we think the bottom line is how you're doing financially but that's just a means to satisfy the inner bottom line which is am i feeling okay that's what we're looking for in the world is to come back to feeling okay now most of the time the discontent we feel is self-created we're imagining something that might go wrong or something we like which which we might lose or something but we're creating discontent in our mind and then we go about trying to ease that discontent by doing something in the world and so we think you know i'm not feeling content therefore i need to do something get something buy something go somewhere have a conversation with someone about something. Sometimes sometimes that is the right thing to do. But a lot of the time, we're trying to ease 
we're creating discontent in ourselves and then not recognize we've created that discontent, we go out into the world looking for ways to feel better again. And I think that's, that's fundamentally where uh, our society, I think all societies that I can think of, human societies, I'm not sure about some of the you know, indigenous peoples, but I think most societies in the developed world, we're continually chasing things in the world in order to, looking for contentment. And, you know, we may find some temporary contentment. We, we get something, we feel, you know, buy a new jacket or something, and we feel good. And we think it's the buying, the, we think it's buying the jacket that's made us feel good. But in a way, it's not at all. It's like we've created discontent. You know, I don't have this piece of clothing I want. And so when we get it, we've stopped creating that bit of discontent. And this is what um, spiritual teachings call samsara, which literally means to wander on endlessly. We wander on endlessly from one chasing one thing to another thing to another thing. And they all just bring some, you know, it's not they all, some of them bring some temporary satisfaction, some of them bring no sat satisfaction whatsoever. But this is why our attention is so caught up in the material world. I think this is how we, we've come to be in this world where we're, we're so busy chasing things the whole time, why we're in this materialist culture, which is continually, you know, misusing the environment, taking from the environment, really spoiling our chances of survival. I think it all comes back to this um, erroneous way of thinking that we've got caught in. In and some so, sense, I, I think I've heard you share before that we're kind of, and I kind of feel this way as well, we're kind of, everything's perfect in every way. And where we are right now is exactly where we're meant to be. And everything that's happened has happened in the way that it was meant to. Instead of like, oh, we're in a place that's so wrong right now. Because it seems like, although there may be so many things that seem to be on one side to be um, dark in a way of putting it there's mm -hmm. also an equal amount of light and it mm -hmm. depends on your perspective i guess yes um i don't like to use the terms meant to be that implies there's some sort of um organizing purpose or something yeah uh, i would just to say that this is the way things are this is the way things are yeah yeah. yeah, and not to get upset about them, not to not to start blaming people in the past for having got things wrong. It's like, okay, this this is how things are, and to accept accept the present moment. So much of the time, people complain about the present moment, and there's actually no point whatsoever in complaining about things. It's like, okay, if we don't like how things are, let's get down and work out how to improve things, how to change things. There seems to be a, a sense of perfection about life. And when I say meant to be, I guess it just seems perfect in a sense. Uh, I think we've talked about yeah. in the past. It, it depends. I think, you know, for us, who are the more privileged members of the human race, we can feel that way. I think yes. it's very hard for, you know, the people who are, starving you know on the poverty line or re really sick with things they are so really in, caught up engrossed by what they are facing i'm sure it, it doesn't seem perfect for them it that, seems like. yeah 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 i can definitely feel into yeah. that um so from from someone like that's perspective do you feel as though you know it may be quite difficult to to come to that sense of acceptance. Yes. And to to come to that sense of inner peace and realizing that they do have also the conditions for happiness all around them. Yes. Um, I don't know. Yes, the way I see it, it's not so much we have the conditions for happiness. We have the mind that creates unhappiness. Mm. And so the condition for happiness is not finding the right things in the world to make us happy, but is stepping back from the thinking 
that's creating unhappiness. Mm. We've got think, we've got what we need though to reach that point. I mean, we you know we the more privileged people certainly have that, and we have we're learning a lot from each other. That's what I think is so significant about these times. We're yeah, just, we're learning. You know, right now we're talking about it, and you know, some people will watch this, and hopefully, some of them will glean something from it, which will be useful in their own journey. And yeah, they're, yeah. They're, and they share it with other people, and you know, I'm learning from people the whole time. So I think collectively, you know, we are learning about this really this thing of just really letting go and coming back to ourselves, coming back to that inner being. And the more we do that the more it's going to you know influence other people and spread out into the world so th that gives me hope yeah it almost seems like it's 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 a significant thing to mention but there's this balance between feeling into the suffering that others are experiencing which can be difficult to do in one sense if we're not directly in touch with them but i think through the through the suffering that we go through we're able to tap into that and mm. feel what's happening collectively in our own way yeah yeah and then there's also the holding that and being with everything that's beautiful at the same time because there it's it, i don't know it still feels like there is there is so much like i said i don't know dark and light is a strange way to put it but it seems like there's there's both happening at the same time and there's, it's like a balancing act of being with it all yeah 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 and also of course you know even in our own lives what we see as dark and what we see as light is is our interpretation of things in some ways i think you know the, the world is a dark and light the world the world is the way it is yeah and then and then we interpret it or judge it according to our own perspective our own needs and so we things that are somehow getting in our way we sort of judge as dark and things which are really supporting us we judge as light mm -hmm. but i don't i don't think there's light and my feeling is there isn't light and dark in the world there's there's actions which are maybe not so helpful for other people and actions which are more helpful but you know when we put that label on it that's something that's a judgment coming from ourselves yeah no i definitely agree with you that's why i was kind of hesitant to use those terms but i was kind of reaching for a better way to express myself i guess yeah okay that's interesting i think i've learned a lot just from that little segment so i appreciate that <laughs> um yeah this is another thought and feeling i've had and it's it's the one that sometimes I feel as though collectively or if a portion of us were to go back in a sense, we would be moving forward. This idea of going back to the land and maybe decoupling a little bit from technology and finding other ways of being that maybe are outside of what we've grown up within and what's normal. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, but it seems like there's there's this this exponential curve that we spoke about last time. This idea that things are speeding up exponentially because of this positive feedback loop or a feedback loop of some sort. And then um that's happening on all different fronts in all different directions. We spoke about, you know, technology as that develops and um, you know, we move, we propel into that direction and things just speed up. And that they will continue to do so it seems and then with the awakening of of consciousness that's that's kind of or, or the awakening or the collective awakening that seems to be a thing as well that's going on so that all these things are kind of happening simultaneously and it's yeah it especially with the recent pandemic and everything that that um brought into being i guess and the experiences people went through through that and this this definitely seems like since the last time we spoke pre pre-pandemic and now wherever we're at at the moment it seems like there's definitely been an acceleration from that point and you kind of mentioned it before that as well so i wanted to just kind of 
see if you had any thoughts on where things were going and what you'd have to say about that. Obviously, um, just from a broad sense and what you're feeling into and um, anything you had to share about the exponential curve would be, I think, very beneficial and be very interesting anyways. Yes. Um, I mean, everybody's talking now about, you know, the pace of change speeding up. It's been speeding up since day one. Yeah. Um, and the do you, reason it's do you been feel done, like there's been a day one? Um, well, you could say the beginning of the universe, mm -hmm. or you know, but you, you can see biological evolution has been speeding up. It took billions of years for the simple cells to reach the stage of becoming multicellular organisms, like two or three cells collecting together into very simple sponges. That took about three billion years for that to happen. And then, you know, they start evolving to more complex creatures, more complex. And, you know, we, the, the human being is, our lifetime is 1% of 1% of 1% of 1% of Earth's history. We are just literally a blink in time. In fact, if you take our, our whole lifetime, take our lifetime and how long it takes to blink, then that moment of a blink is our is our lifetime in the life of the in the life of the universe? Mm. So we are just just that we are just a, a momentary flash our life, and that's and you know things have been going faster and faster with hu with humanity. You know, for whatever it was, I think, you know, we some time ago maybe a million thousand uh, no a million years ago we probably started developing. It looks like you know early early tools and things. We know three million years ago, but then. You know, agriculture, about 10, fire was before that. Agriculture was about 10,000 years ago. And the Industrial Revolution was 250, 300 years ago. You know, the 20th century, the beginning of computers was only really 50, 60 years ago. The internet was 30 years ago. Now this speeding up is because each stage of development actually makes it easier for the next stage, it creates possibilities for the next stage to develop. So you know, the Industrial Revolution, really, whatever that was, I say 300 years ago it really began, that gave us the technology of machines, how to, how to use machines to make things. It set up the technology of mass production, mass distribution. So when we started building computers, we didn't have to go back to the beginning, we could use our understanding of how to manufacture, our understanding of how to distribute, we could use that. So computers jumped on the bandwagon. And now as we start moving into, you know, areas of artificial intelligence, etc., we don't have to reinvent computers. We jump on to where the computers have got us to, and that moves us faster. So this moving faster and faster is an inevitable part of evolution. It's inevitable. It was, there's no stopping it. People say, oh, can't we slow things down? There's no way. It's, in a way, it's, it's a consequence of creativity, of, the, of life being creative, of our own being creative. In one way, I sound Aren't we, creative. in a sense, by taking a breath, slowing things down, though? Yes, in our, in our life, but we're not slowing down the growth of yeah. the pace of technology. Yeah. We're slowing ourselves down, which is a really important way for us to live in a world that's going faster and faster and faster. Yeah. To save ourselves getting burnt out. Mm. But basically, creativity breeds more creativity. And so that's why things keep on going faster. Do you feel like there may be a burning out of the, of the system itself? Yeah, I think so. Yes, I think that's beginning to happen or has been happening. We're, we're in it. It's a bit like the whole the old story of the frog in boiling water. Or if you heat the water up, the frog doesn't doesn't jump out. If you drop the frog into boiling water, it will jump out immediately. If you slowly heat it up, it will sit there as it gets hotter and hotter and hotter till it dies. And I think, you know, if I look at my own life, I look at how things were in my life 50 years ago and how they are now. It's like, my God, how things have changed, how much faster they are, how relatively leisurely they were back then. Mm. And yet you know, the way things are seems normal. And yet 50 years ago, if I was thrown into this life now, I think, my God, how do people cope? Would you be jumping out of that water? Uh, yeah. Yes, I probably would be. You wouldn't <laughs> accept it and, and come into a state of being with it? Um, I, I don't know. It's hypothetical. 
here I am, here I am, and doing my best to not get too caught up in it all. Yeah. How do you do that? Well, I think what we've been talking about is taking time to come back, to come back to self, to reconnect with, with what is true and valuable in ourself and not be so taken over by all the seduction society has, its ways of manipulating us, to come back to our own inner truth, our own inner wisdom. Yeah, there seems to be, I don't know, the way I'm looking at things at least, there's like two perspectives, there's two, the one part of it is the coming back and the returning and the and the kind of the beingness. And obviously everything is all connected up, but the other part seems to be almost like um, the stepping away from, like um, it seems like when I pick up my phone, for example, I'm sucked into like a vortex and something's going on and it's definitely not a state of being. It's like something else. It's almost like I'm, it's like a different version of reality. Mm -hmm. And that happens with all screens most of the yeah. time. Yeah. And I think like starving myself from that side of things and then coming into a state of beingness because I've created, I've created the conditions to make that a lot easier for myself rather mm -hmm. than trying to, you know, go both ways at once, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find yourself kind of taking detoxes from technology and moving into nature? I mean, it seems like you probably live in nature. but I do, but no, I find myself thinking I should and doing it occasionally, but I should. I would like to do it more than I do. Yeah. I think it's really important. Yeah. Yeah. We, we could probably always do it more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ah, well, thank you so much for sharing. This has been good. So I just... Yeah, I'm. I'm kind of curious about what your what your days look like. Like, what do you do? What, what do you get up to? And um, I'm kind of. I've got this curiosity around your life, Peter. Um, my days are pretty um, boring. <laughs> I I get up and I have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, depending on my mood, um, and then I just. I spend probably half an hour moving into the day. Um, I meditate a bit. I do some journaling. And then maybe make myself a smoothie or something. And then just gradually you know, start moving into things. I start just, I always just like to check the news for a minute, just to check that the world is still there. But I don't find there's anything of particular interest these days. And then just mundane things. I like to just sort of go into my emails and make sure there's nothing urgent that needs attending to. And then I probably do a bit, a little bit of stretching exercise. And then depends what I'm working on, you know, whatever project I'm working on. If I'm writing something, I'll think, okay, I'll pick up something. And my, my creative working time whether it's planning a talk or writing something, whatever it is, that's best for me until about the middle of, middle of the afternoon. And so I tend to be working like that, not hard, but just whatever projects I've got, but that's my project time, um, move to the middle of the afternoon. And then probably if there's things that need doing on the property, do something there, um, often meditate again later, early evening, and then cook some food and, hang out, maybe chat with friends and go back to bed. It's a pretty good day to me. Do you find like the um, the mundaneness or the, you, you said it like seems boring. Do you think all that becomes exciting when you're more present? Or at of least course. like the quality becomes richer? Of course. I mean, the more present we are, the more in touch we are with what's going on, not only in the world around us, but within ourselves. We're, we're not so distracted by it. All that thinking so yes the more present we are the more we can i would say appreciate what's going on appreciate the experience the process Definitely. yeah how did you in the early days be, kind of begin to decouple yourself from the fruits of of, of your action oh um i'm still not totally decoupled let's be clear on that um 
Again, I think meditation. Meditation was for me the way. Just be able to step back from step back in back into myself into the present moment and see, just really to see that my my inner well-being came from within me rather than from what I did in the world. And just having that experience is like, ah, this feels good. This is what I'm looking for in the world. And it's right here in me. I just need to slow down, as we've been talking about from the very beginning, slow down, step back from the thinking process and just notice how it feels to just be it's like, ah, here I am. Here I am in this moment. And just to just to relish that, really, just to relish it. Because it's such a lovely quality. It seems a life uh, full of these beautiful small moments and yeah. appreciating them is like yeah. a beautiful yeah. thing. And just kind of jumping back to the comment you made about light and dark and kind of your perspectives on, you know, everything seems to be just the way in which we're, we're looking at it, especially when it comes to light and dark. This idea of uh, focusing inwards and trusting or having faith that that will change everything outwardly as well and, and be able to kind of radiate. A bird just landed on my windowsill. <laughs> be able to kind of just radiate outwards and, and affect the people around you in a beautiful way. Mm-hmm. is. But it's it's almost as, as though we, we see that playing out, like we see that process playing out, but it's still kind of mysterious and invisible to us. Do you find that? Yes, um, I don't find it mysterious, it's certainly invisible because it's not something that's material or tangible that's happening. So it's not visible in the way that, you know, other processes are visible. But I think it's just very, it's a very straightforward to the truth of life. If I'm, you know, if I'm feeling frazzled and angry and upset and tense, then the way I'm going to interact with people is going to reflect that. And they're going to pick up a bit of that tension. And, and it, that's so it spreads. And if it's the opposite, if I'm feeling at peace, more centered in myself and not, you know, judging people or getting angry at them, and that, that sense of me being more at peace, other people are going to feel that. And that's going to, the result is they're going to feel some of that. So I think it's just a completely natural thing that how we are spreads to other people whether it's good or whether, you know, uptight, tense, or whether it's relaxed and composed, whatever it is, is going to influence other people just through normal human interaction. So I don't think there's anything mysterious about it. I I think that, yeah, definitely. There's a good point there. I guess when you're all deep within the chaos of everything else we've been talking about, distraction and, um, Mm -hmm. you know, the seduction of these experiences, it may seem, seem a bit more mysterious because you're kind of a bit more out of touch with your own inner stillness. Yeah, yeah. There's this, that seems like, again, we're talking about these feedback loops again, because it seems like that would feed back into you again, enrich you even more, and that would just keep going. Yeah. And that in itself may be something that's a contributing factor to. Yes, we're all feeding back. Great awakening. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just an interesting thought <laughs> and it's interesting to feel into what's going on in this moment as well. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, this seems like the topic of our chat's almost been feedback loops in a sense. Um, yeah. but we've, we've covered a lot of ground. I was, I was wondering, um, this kind of feeds into something that I've been thinking about a lot and working on quite a bit and this idea of, and I, I really wanted to hear your, your take with your scientific background and you know, your background um, with meditation and and even the background of our previous discussion, this idea of vibrations. Um, and and the, the word vibes has been thrown around quite a bit. Um, and that's kind of like a, it's been used in different ways. And I wanted to see what your thought on vibrations were. Because um, we were almost talking about something where it's almost like 
you could even see that as emitting a certain vibration. Right. I don't like the word myself. Can um, you tell me why? Yeah. It's one of these, it's, um, it's a misappropriation. It's a misappropriation from science, from physics, into a more interpersonal social realm. Mm. In physics, a vibration is an oscillation of something moving backwards and forwards, whether it's, you know, a tuning fork vibrating or, you know, the earth vibrating because of earthquakes or whatever it is, or, you know, light is a vibration. So in physics, almost every vibration runs through everything and it's an actual alternating phenomenon. Then we use the word so loosely in the sort of psychosocial realm to mean some, you know, something else is going on. I'd much rather people use the more specific words. So if they're saying, oh, it's, you know, it's your vibration. What do you actually mean by that? Yeah. So using the word vibration is a sort of get out of jail. Well, it's not get out of jail free card. It's a sort of get out of a difficulty of communicating card. It's vibrations. It's all vibrations. It, yeah. it isn't. Because we're not, we're not actually it talking. It definitely about be used in that sense. I feel yeah. like, although you don't like it, I feel like it's actually quite interesting that it has been used in so many different ways because there's more than just that way. And yes, but then it gets confusing because we think we're talking about physical stuff and we're not. We're not talking about vibrations mm. themselves. We're talking about a feeling of connection or something like that. What do you feel about vibrations themselves though? And this idea of the first thing that comes to mind and how the two might cross over might be something like I've heard something along the lines of when there's a certain your heart emits a certain vibration, vibrational frequency or something. I'm not sure if I'm using the right language here. Maybe you can no, correct not. me on that. You can probably correct me on that. Yeah. But well, there's, a, there's a sense of electromagnetic neg electromagnetic field that um, your being gives off or is there some kind of energetic vibration that is linked with another person um, i don't think so. not okay. in not in that sense this okay. is where we confuse physics with us with a psychological experience yeah now yeah. there is stuff around the heart the electromagnetic field which the heart mass people have been exploring mm. which is that's what i'm talking about yeah it's an electromagnetic field which you can detect scientifically but you know the vibration of that electromagnetic field is something but it that's just that's not something you pick up at you know from another person so when we're talking about yeah. when we're talking about this i'm sorry to go on about this but i think it's important yeah yeah it's interesting we we don't it stops us actually thinking about what is going on it's like saying it's vibration or it's energy just isn't saying anything i'd much rather when people say I feel, supposing someone says, I feel your vibration. Okay, what I want to know is, what are you actually feeling? You're not feeling a brrrr, you're not feeling a vibration. You may be feeling more at peace or mm. more upset. That's what you should tell me. Is like, when I'm with you, I feel, say, I feel more calm. Instead of saying, I feel your vibration, you say, when I'm with you, I feel more calm. Okay, that is a true statement of what you're feeling. Mm. I think that's what we should do is, is actually describe our experience rather than lumping it under this term vibration, which we don't really know what we mean. Mm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you. It can be this kind of airy, fairy, fluffy term that's thrown around. And yeah, yeah for sure. And, and I know the younger people mean it in a sense like, you know, this is... And one way to use it is like when you're listening to different types of music, there'll be a spectrum of feeling, mm -hmm. energy, uh, atmosphere that's created. And, you know, it's got a certain vibe, if you like. Yeah. So that's kind of one way people use it. Yeah. And yeah. It's, yeah. It's language is, in, is an interesting thing because we're kind of, we're reducing a lot of things to language a lot of the time, aren't we? Yeah, but I think that's a, that's a legitimate way of using the word. We're not when you say, "Oh, the, you know, I like the vibe of this music." Say, 
we're not claiming there's something esoteric going on in a vibration mm. field of energy. Mm. We're just talking about our personal response. I like mm. the bubble. That's a different use of the word. And then there's something, it just fits in so many different areas. I just find it fascinating. It fits into music. It fits also into, into language like we were just talking about. You know, if I'm speaking in a certain way, that vibration is picked up by your 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 vibration picker uppers over here and you know something happens within from that sound like something new is created i guess it's like a remix of old elements it's creativity in a sense and there's you know ancient chants that i find fascinating where they have they've created sounds the the link between vibration and feeling i think there is a link there and it is interesting mm -hmm. but i know what you mean about people throwing around the term really loosely um, they, they mean something by it but if you ask them they have no idea i've never found anybody who would yeah, it's interesting speak. saying things just speaking things that that yeah almost like a repetitive regurgitation function or speaking things from a place of not really just just to fill space and just saying things right yeah, yeah yeah do you do you have any i i'd had like do you have any insight on vibration itself that you might be able to share about you know some people say you know everything's vibration and i've heard that thrown around a lot as well and well it's true in physics that um it's os it's oscillation if everything every every interaction there's some form of oscillation there and that's the mathematics of it. It comes down to very basic equations, which are, which are oscillations. Mm. So you can describe almost everything. I, I won't say everything because in a moment I'll think of an exception, but you can describe almost everything in terms of a mathematical oscillation that's happening. Mm. It doesn't mean there's actually necessarily anything physical happening, but the equations are all what are called wave equations at the, at the very basic they're, they're wave equations so in that sense oscillation plays a fundamental role in physics and then people say oh therefore you know everything is vibration it's like it's true that everything in the material world can be described in terms of oscillations but then people jump from that into some statement about reality and consciousness and how I'm feeling and all that stuff, which is totally invalid. Mm. I mean, that little bridge is where the care needs to be given. And as I say, I'm not, I'm not saying there aren't these experiences of feeling some connection or whatever it is, but let's describe it in terms of our actual experience rather than using some scapegoat term, which we can understand. Yeah. Yeah, I find, like I said earlier, I just find it a really fascinating um, kind of crevice to open up and look into and mm -hmm. and explore, I guess. Yeah. Thank you for sharing <laughs> your thoughts on vi vibration. Um, yeah, I thought you might be a good person to ask for that. Would you be able to little, tell me a little bit about your new book? So Letting Go of Nothing, Relax Your Mind and Discover the Wonder of Your True Nature. I'm sure it's got yeah. a, it's sure you, in that book, you're going to share a lot about what we've been talking about today, but yeah, yes, tell me a bit about quite, it. Quite a bit. Um, it's a book I've been wanting to write for many years and probably wasn't ready to write it until this year, really, or last year. And it's about letting go, but it's more than that. It's really a summation of my... Um, discoveries and learnings about the nature of consciousness and the nature, the value of letting go as part of the spiritual work. And it's really what I've gleaned from my own life. It's not a book that references other people or other teachings. It's just, it's based on my experiences with my stories of how to, how to let go, which we always find so difficult. And what the essence of the book is, I reframe letting go as letting in and letting be. We usually think of letting go as trying to get rid of some experience or getting rid of some thought. And my approach is no, instead of pushing things away, what, what it is we want to let go of, let in the experience of holding on, let in what are the feelings here? What's going on? What's going on in your mind? And as we do that, we can begin to 
it begins to release of its own accord. And it gets into you know, some of the stuff we've been talking about, but also the nature of ego, the nature of self, the nature of love and kindness. And the nature of love, that sounds beautiful. Yeah, um, which is, I think, our true nature. Um, when we're not caught up in our thinking, all that stuff we've been talking about before, when you, when you come back to that space of, space of silence inside, you are in lovingness. So, so I look at that and how we, how we get caught up in the world, some of the things we've been talking about today. And, and the subtitle sort of also says it all really, relax your mind, that's the key thing. Let your thinking mind relax and then you discover the wonder of who you really are, this incredible conscious being. Hmm. Do you feel like maybe someone reading this material, it would help them kind of connect a few dots within their own life and, you know. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. Really hope so. Yeah. It's a beautiful yeah. thing. The first thing I've done of this nature in the book, my other books have been more sort of about the world in one way or another, you know, evolution we were talking about, other things. This is the first book I've done, which is really about spiritual awakening. And my and my my personal take on spiritual awakening. Hmm. And how can people, you know, get a copy, check it out? I'm going to leave some links, but and I know maybe share it's your website, but I just know on your website it's one really cool thing you can check out how old you are in days. I don't know if that's still on there, but that was cool. Yeah, that's still there. Um, it won't be. It will be available through. Well, I know it's available on Amazon. It is not actually. It's published on August the eighth. No, August the tenth. Um, but I know a lot of people are pre-ordering it on Amazon already. Um, I, I hear from their sales figures, from my publishers. So Amazon or, or wherever you like to buy books. Um, yeah. Online or support your local bookstore. As I say, in Australia, um, if it's published in the US in August the 10th, it's usually about four to five weeks later that it'll be published in bookstores, you know, and probably on Amazon Australia because it takes time to get into the store so it's probably going to be mid-september so probably where, yeah this interview yeah, probably won't be out for a little while so it'll probably yeah. be good timing when it comes out because they have to they have to ship the books physically you know they have to yeah get them into containers get them onto ships get them over there get yeah. them out the containers so it's usually about say it say a month to four to five weeks maybe six weeks then it should be available yeah, yeah. awesome I'm just conscious of time and, and I don't want to kind of run this too deep. I do have one other kind of question, but I can always save it for next time. I was just wondering how you're feeling with time at the moment. Um, we're getting there. We should be wrapping up. But give me the question. I'm not probably take the question out and save it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just let you know. It's it's this idea of um, it, it's dancing around what, what, we, what we've been talking about, but the idea of uh, comfort and discomfort and almost like our threshold for, for discomfort and a way in which that we're used to being in comfort seems to kind of stunt growth or limit limit expansion. Just want to see what you feel about that. Um, say a bit more. I'm not quite sure what you're pointing to. Say a little bit more. Well, um, I think we've spoken in the past around this idea of sitting uh, with a certain pain that may arise, whether it's emotional. Or physical yeah, and, yeah. and almost diving yeah. into it instead of running away from it. Um, right. okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and that that's the I said, you know, letting go is letting in and letting be. And that's the letting in bit of when we when we've got discomfort, we tend to push it away. We don't like discomfort. We don't want it, whether it's pain or some distress or discomfort. It's not pleasant. That's why we call it discomfort. We're not comfortable with it. And so what we want to do is get rid of it. And what I have found is that the discomfort is actually, whatever it is, is, is some call for attention. If it's a physical discomfort, it's the body saying, hey, there's something up here, attention please. Or if it's some, if having a discomfort in terms of a relationship with a person or a communication, it's like, okay, attention please, there's something that needs tending to. And so that's why I say, if there's discomfort, let it in. What we tend to do, as I say, because we don't like it, we push it away. 
but to, to let it in. And usually when we do, we find it isn't as uncomfortable as we expected. Um, part of the discomfort is actually our resistance to noticing it. And so let it in. And as, as you're saying right at the beginning of this talk, it's letting in the feeling. If there's discomfort, it's like, there's nearly always going to be a feeling in the body somewhere or other. There's going to be some sensation somewhere, either in the physical body or a more subtle feeling. Notice what's there in terms of the feeling, because that will be the clue to what is going on. Because your body is telling you something here. The body's telling you the truth in a way. And by tuning into it, you can see what it's pointing towards. And I find that really good, particularly in terms of social personal things when i feel some discomfort going on it's like i sit down and i i feel into it it's like ah that's what it's about so it will reveal itself so that's why i say be be with the discomfort don't try to push it away be with it because that will be your teacher mm -hmm. it's a beautiful message to end with thank yeah. you so much for agreeing to chat peter today and okay. hopefully yeah Hopefully this will help some people out and, and yeah, it'd be nice to maybe even touch base again in another year or two. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, things are always moving on with me, I hope. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode with Peter Russell. Hopefully there's more to come in the future, but I really enjoy conversations with Peter as they're always thought provoking and afterwards always give me plenty to reflect on. I hope that this conversation has had the same effect on you. If you are getting something valuable from the conversations and you'd like to take things to the next level and deepen your connection, then please consider joining the Today Dreamer tribe over at patreon.com forward slash Today Dreamer. And depending on the pledge level, there's certain perks available, including guided meditations and exclusive podcasts, special video content and monthly holding or held space hangouts with a supportive community of like-minded individuals. Thank you so much for tuning in and I will catch you in the next episode. Be well.